Hello, folks. Um, well, first of all, just thanks to the uh, oops, Irish Jordan Society for having me and us all here. And uh, thank you to the speakers who went before me. I was uh, very humbled by some of the presentations I heard this morning, uh, some of the best presentations I've heard in a long time. Um, I'm not a translation expert. Um, I'm not here with any knowledge. Uh, I don't own any big protective structures anymore. I used to. I've been at Billings and Marion Square for a long time, got rid of in 2006 for just this reason that we're talking about now. Um, what I'm here, the hat I'm wearing here today is my planner's hat, and I'm not even a planner. Um, but my work and my, of my companies takes me all over Ireland doing development plans and strategic environmental assessments and appropriate assessments and all those kinds of assessments. And they find me sitting in council chambers at night in Longford and Leitrim and Kerry and Cork. And you kind of get the feel for what's going on the length and breadth of the country. So I'm here bringing you messages from that frontier, so to speak. I'm also here because uh, Mary Bryant is very persistent and despite my complete inability to complete things to deadlines 10 years ago, uh, she still brought me back 10 years later, which is today, because I facilitated the same session we had 10 years ago. So that's one of the reasons I'm here as well, because things I saw and learned that day have stuck with me. Not always for the best. So I suppose I'm one of those friends to you in this conservation community, who I hope is trusted to tell you things that you need to hear, but which you may not always want to hear. And I see that as my job today, as a kind of a closing set of curtains, and perhaps even, as Mary might say, a provocateur to get the next session going. Yeah, how does this work? Press random point. Nothing. Nine o'clock. Press random point. Press random point. Oh dear. This is the phrase that has me here. I've never forgotten. It was used at the end of the discussion we had 10 years ago by somebody for whom I have had a lifelong respect. And it wasn't challenged by anybody in the room. And I've never forgotten it. I'd rather see the building rot than see it badly used. I'm going to talk to you today about addressing that issue. And as our American friends say, the takeaway messages that I'm going to leave you with are to emphasize a point that was made, not just eloquently, but lyrically by Gronda Shaffrey earlier, about the fact that fundamentally, there is no point in beginning to even think about protection until we have considered use. And that use can only take place in the context of prosperity economic stability, the money to pay for the building and its shutter and its roof and its rainwear, that that prosperity itself can be facilitated through the planning system, which I'll talk a little bit about, and that the planning system with no, due respect, dis, with no disrespect to the wonderful Fergal Aquili and, and Martin Kilreedy who spoke this morning is not something that any of us, and I use the word planning in the largest sense of the planning and the regulations, should rest upon our laurels about. There is work to be done, a lot of work to be done. That's what I want to talk about. The conservation, the preservation of this building can never take place outside of a context. It will only take place in the context of a street upon which somebody wishes to carry out a business in a neighborhood where cho somebody chooses to make their home. The building will never be separate from the use, and the use will never be separate from demand. And demand will never be separate from money, and the ability to recover the money that you may have to pay in rent or purchase. It's fundamental. You choose to ignore that at your peril. You choose to ignore that and say, that's not my business, la, 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 la. I just do conservation. The essence of conservation is use and life and vitality. It is your business. It is your business, I'm going to put it to you this morning, or this afternoon, 
But if you put obstacles in the way to that, by your zeal in the application of technical specifics, by unreasonable demands for information or materials or professional services, <coughs> that you may well cause the death of the very thing you love. I'm saying that to you, it's not pleasant to say it, and it must be worse to hear it. But I've been given the privilege of standing here in front of you and holding this mirror up to you. So this is the first of a number of challenges I'll give you, is that you must turn your faces toward facilitating the renewal, not of the buildings, but just make sure that you're facilitating the renewal of the local economy first, and then the buildings. These are wretched streets. I didn't take one of my precious little towns and villages that I go to up and down the country for fear of giving offence. But the small towns and villages of Ireland are dying. All of them. Graveyards with lights on, as people say, from the town my mother comes from. They're not boarded up as much as this yet. The pound shops, the charity shops, the Sue Ryder shops, the slow cancer of urban decay is eating away at the heart of all of them. And what we see that as being as something is, that's not really my problem or not my fault. And this morning we heard one of the brightest, sharpest knives in the box say, and it's terrible because everybody's moving out to the edge of town. Isn't that just awful? Well, I want you to stop and ask why they're moving out to the edge of the town. I teach our students to look to the ultimate and not the proximate causes of problems, and I'm trying to ask you to do the same thing today. This little street here, for, perhaps, could come to life if we can use our intelligence and our training and the responsibilities that a number of people in this room have to make the high street preserved building easier to go to than the one at the edge of the town, cheaper to go to than the one at the edge of the town, better to use and faster to get through the system. Property in the retail sector is a property of marginal economics. 5% is the difference between succeeding and failing. That 5% is in your hand, it's in your folder on your desk. You have that responsibility. To harp on, to bang upon the theme of use as a prerequisite for protection, I want you to try, for instance, to think a little different about the one thing that is my business, which is to talk to you about cities. We teach our wonderful planning students in DIT that the city is not a noun. The city is a verb. It's more like a dance than a painting or a piece of sculpture. There are a series of activities. They're not an artifact. Once you grasp that fundamental difference, you realize that things that you might use, approaches and philosophies you might have that might work with a piece of sculpture, or a painting or a building, immediately break down once you step outside the front door of that building. You don't conserve a city. Cities are continued. Rome and cities like that, they are eternal cities. That's what the word means, an eternal city, constantly being renewed by people like Jim this morning. It's interesting, Jim, how often you use the word service. We serve the city. That word goes all the way back, speaking of Rome, to the SPQR that were on public buildings all over Rome. We serve the Senate and the people of Rome every single day. We're keeping it alive. It's a constant tending process. So think of the city like this, like a dance, and think of what happens to things like music when people seek to preserve music and cause it to never change. God knows Clothus nearly killed off Irish music by those approaches. <laughs> Other more vigorous new stra strands of music came in the 1970s and 80s. So, I would challenge you in this room to look into your hearts professionally and vocationally and to ask if perhaps some attitudes need to change. If the kind of wonderful speech that Gloria gave this morning is anything to go by, that process is well underway. <coughs> so, think at the very basic level of this little street, an Ahmed is thinking of setting up his kebab shop with Fatima, his wife. And they have two choices. This building at the top here that might have a Dutch billy or something hiding behind it, and this effort here on the left-hand side. Right? They're good people, Ahmed and Fatima.
that you want. If they set a business up, they'll stick with it for 20, 25 years. Maybe their kids will take it over afterwards. Think about what that 25 years means. 25 years of the roof being fixed, 25 years of the rainwater pipes being looked after, 25 years of the building being heated, 25 years of a burglar alarm in place. The building will be completely covered in plastic, the interior will be completely formica on the ground floor, the upstairs will be used for packing boxes, but you know what? In 25 years, the building will still be there. And that 25 years is a very small proportion of the amount of time that building has been standing there since it's built. Think strategically. They're not going to take that building. They're going to take the other one. Because it's faster and cheaper and easier. And no one's going to give them brain damage. <laughs> so, I would put it to you, I would make the assertion, that for the vast majority of the people in the rooms that I speak to in the evening, in council chambers, up and down the country, heritage is seen as a constraint and not a contribution. And you can talk all you like about the number of craftsmen and women who would be employed in plastering and painting and chipping and looking after the building while it's been renewed, and they will, and there will certainly be money spent that year. But you know what? Ahmed and Fatima will work in that shop for 25 years and put money and rates and wages and buy potatoes and fish in that town for 25 years. That's real money. That's what will keep the town really alive. That's what will keep the building really looked after. Just standing. Another assertion. We heard this in this room this morning. Martin is one of the sharpest hands in the draw. He knows exactly what he's talking about, but he did say those words. Retail in all the Irish towns is in the wrong place. Now I'm going to pick on just one Irish town here. Sligo, which I adore. Bottom right hand corner, the pinky red area there, the commercial centre of Sligo, right? I mean, Sligo has gotten as many things as you could get right, right, the beautiful walk along the river, all the collection of the backlands up behind Dunn's and Tesco's there to knock all the car parks together to keep all the business downtown, but it still has that blight I described on that main street there. All the life has moved down to the, uh, out onto the square behind Dunn's or out onto the river. And why is the main street dying? Protected structures. You can't move on the main street without falling over a protected structure. Mm, look at Carrick and Shannon. Not a lot to go around in Carrick and Shannon, but you know what? All those black buildings that protect the structures, the future is weighted against the downtown. If somebody wants to start a new business in Sligo or in Carrick and Shannon, you know where they're going, don't you? You've all passed those big slab buildings in the outskirts because they are cheaper and bigger and have the floor plate that people want and the car park that people want and they'll get through the planning system in four months. They will. You don't have to like what I'm saying for it to be true. So, assertion that our current approach contributes to the flight of the urban edges and that if we continue to get it wrong with protected structures, most of our urban areas will never economically recover. It's not just Dublin. The vast majority of Irish protected structures exist in the urban cores of our towns and villages. They're either going to be an opportunity or a blight. And we have very little time to review our regulations. This gives me the opportunity to touch on some of the things that have been mentioned by the previous speakers. Economic cycles. That's a typical set of economic cycles. These things are rot and rubbish, by the way, but just to put them on the table for what it's worth. And this is somebody from Princeton showing them going up and down. I had an appalling or maybe wonderful experience on Friday night. I was in Nesbitt and a man came up to me and he said, I've got to introduce you to my friend. Why, says I. <laughs> Well, I was that senior executive from AIB Bank who invited you in in 2007 to talk about the future. And at the end of it, somebody said to you, because I heard him, he said, sure, if even half of what you said is true, half of us in this room will have no jobs in 12 months' time. He said, you were wrong. None of us have jobs now. <laughs> so I want you to introduce, Frank, he said, this is the fellow I was telling you about that I always talk about in therapy. <laughs> I'm not an economist, but the bloody dogs in the street could see that if you're paying a price for a piece of property that was 10 times the rental value in a year, that made sense. If you were paying 100 times that, it could not and would not ever, ever, ever make sense. I had to go into my poor wife and my poor accountant and people like that in 2006 and said, sell all of my property. Sell all of it except the house I live in. And my wonderful accountant said, Connor, you're a peasant. You're a complete peasant. <laughs> I'm a very 
very wealthy peasant now. <laughs> so that's the old economic cycle. This is another one with stuff stuck onto the end of it showing 2013 there as a little spiky recovery. 2015, don't believe a word of it. But you know what a funny thing is? The people who tell you this is going to go on for another 20 years, they're the same people who were telling you in 2007, yet, bother, soft landing, no problem. This time it's different, right? There are little small numbers across the top. The red line is 2006, 2007, when the wheels started to come off the wagon. Blue is a prosperous period. Pink is unprosperous period. A typical economic cycle, eight and a half year cycle laid across that. They could go any particular way. That's where Frank, can you see here, Frank? Frank was saying the last time we had this meeting, we were on that point in the slope, just on our way up. This is where we are now, probably fairly near the bottom. You heard somebody from Grand Thorn and they know their stuff saying we're probably somewhere around about that. Now, I would caution all of you with this. Remember this. There is a difference between the behavior and the success of the Irish economy and the recovery of the property market. They are different. If you only remember one thing today, remember that. And within that, the property sector in Ireland for the first time is profoundly different. 50% of Ireland's population live in Leinster now, 52% to be precise. If you property outside of Dublin, it probably won't recover its value for over 15 years. Ask Dr. Brian Hughes at DIT, he'll tell you all about that. Inside Dublin, the animal spirits have started to come back. Little girls' ovaries have started to tingle and they're telling their boyfriends, I really want to have that baby. We need that flat. <laughs> that type of economic cycle sits across another cycle. Our county development plans. Our county development plans run on five-year cycles. Planning is the thing that provides the context where all of our work takes place. Inevitably, there's a lag between our county development plan and the aspirations and the attitudes of the bodies and the realities that we come across. They take two or three years to put into place. So, what I'm saying to you is, this is the main point of this, is that we've got to try to be aware that whatever county development plans we're preparing right now are most likely to be the ones that will rule the roots and make the, make the rules when we move into the next growth period. Time to move. So, that's what might happen going out into the future. The green line is today. We're in the middle of maybe the development plans we have now are the ones that will obtain when the recovery comes across. I suspect all over Ireland, the next one, the one that's probably in preparation at the moment will do it. So all of you, any of you who have any role in planning, and I see a bunch of my students, former students here who are involved in planning, make sure this one errs on the side of expecting growth, not continued shrinkage. The biggest mistake that we will make in the next five years is that we will be surprised by success. And people like Jim Cogan over there will be sitting there having wine with me in Wallace's Tavern and said, you know what, the one thing nobody expected was for things to get better. And Jim is usually right. So, Watch the bottom of the graph here. And the letters on the right are say, you know, fantastic situation. We get a trough in 2013, 2014. That's eight years after the last uh, uh, peak. Uh, nice, it'd be nine years after the nice peak. Fair, it'd be 10 years after the last peak. In the worst case, it'd be 11 years or whatever it is after the last peak. Banking cycles, economic crashes, they have cycles. They always end. They do always end. And when you push out like that, even if it's out there in 2000 and whatever I'm showing there, 16, 17, that it finishes, it's still in the life of a plan that's being drawn up in some county council up and down the country at the moment. Right? So that particular stable is already leaving. Horse is already leaving the sits. It's a stable. All right, I'm almost finished with those people who are fleeing from the room to remind you again, that's why I'm here, that phrase, that awful, well-intentioned phrase. The biggest issue that has to change is the thing between the ears of everybody in the room here. Attitudes, expectations, and the expenses. We need an acceptance of the fact that use is a prerequisite for the protection of these buildings, and that a prosperous context is a prerequisite for that use. And that we urgently need to prepare different rules. Peter Blue, my former classmate, gave a fantastic and eloquent description of the ingenuity and professionalism that can be brought to bear in applying those rules. But lads and lassies in the room, please think of Ahmed and Fatima. Right, Peter, you have enough money. You can't take any more money off Fatima than Fatima. They can't afford it, right? They can barely afford the altar, right? And if we have to put them through Peter and all of his wonderful talent and skill and care for people, 
they're going to go to town, the shop the edge of town. We've got to find a way to help them. And we need different types of plans. Stephen and Herbie has gone, people like that who are bringing planners in the room. We've got to imagine different ways of doing new plans to deal with that. So, we're leaving on that. Same message again. Chin with Project Gale, thank you for your time.